Hi there, history fans. So today we're continuing with a new series, and it's another series from Epic History TV, and it's on the topic of World War One. You decided in the last polls that you want uh, me to continue to cover Epic History TV. So here we are. We already covered the Napoleonic Wars, and the series was amazing. I mean, the narration, the 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 information, the animations. It was really great, and I enjoyed it to go through all of those big battles uh, in the Napoleonic Wars together with you and to receive additional information from all around the world. We have a uh, first YouTube membership, and it's from Marius. Thank you, Marius. All donations on Patreon and, uh, and on YouTube are going to go to new projects where I go out and film some interesting stuff related uh, in Austria and the region because of the situation I cannot go any further outside of uh, Austria about different historical things that happened here and in the neighborhood. Uh, but yeah, if you want to join the history community, it's all about history. Everything you need to know is in the description below. Uh, but I would appreciate if you just hit the subscribe button and maybe click the notification bell. Okay, let's see what they got here for us. Epic History TV. 1914. Of course, the first year of the war. Nineteen fourteen. The great powers of Europe are divided into two rival alliances the Triple Entente, France, Britain, and Russia, united by fear and suspicion of Germany, Europe's new strongest power. Yeah. And the Triple Alliance, Germany, which fears encirclement by its rivals, Austro Hungary, clinging on to a fragile empire, and Italy seeking gains at French expense. The spark comes on the 28th of June in the city of Sarajevo. Yeah, but let's let's just go first to the uh, big picture in Europe. Okay, so the main problem for Germany and Austria-Hungary is that Austria-Hungary actually technically, I mean, they had some colonies outside of Europe or colonies in general, but it was just a few. Germany had some colonies, but Britain and France were the dominating powers in, co in the colonies in Europe. So that was actually a big problem for Germany because all of those nations are going through uh, the industrialization period and they need raw materials to fuel that in industrialization. Germany is going to a rapid in industrialization, but all the raw materials that, uh, that uh, are laying somewhere in the colonies could be exploited by Germany and France. Uh, or Britain and France. Germany didn't have a big naval power, so their connections with, uh, with the colonies that they had in Africa and in Asia, they, their connections weren't that bad, and Britain, as a naval superpower, would just cut off their supply chain to the colonies directly when the war starts. But Germany comes back with the U-boats, Unterwasser boat, uh, underwater boat, uh, to counter the British Navy. And the state with the most population in Europe back then was Austria-Hungary, but you need to take into account that Austria-Hungary was a multinational state, so you had Austrian, Hungarian, Slovenes, Croats, Serbs, Romanians, uh, Polish, Czechs, Slovaks, oh, and I probably forgot somebody, Italians. Austria-Hungary, although it was also in a big European player, it was a fragile player because of uh, a lot of the different ethnicities that lived there, there, especially the Slavic ones, because Russia is pushing the idea of the so-called pan-Slavism in Europe to get all the Slavs on their side, to, to break up practically Austria-Hungary and to get all the Slavs in them. Uh, the South Slavs, so Croats, Slovenes, uh, Serbs living and Croats living in Bosnia, the Muslims in Bosnia, and also uh, in this part of Austria-Hungary, which is called today Vojvodina in Serbia, they all had the idea of Yugoslavism, so to uh, pull out of Austria-Hungary and to create a new state, because uh, a lot of people don't know, but a lot of the other ethnicities, except the dominating one, so Austrians and Hungarians, view... 
um, especially the, the time period in the, uh, in the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, they view Austria-Hungary or the state as the so-called prison of nations. So that they try to suppress the nations, uh, the different small ethnicities inside of the state. So although Germany and Austria-Hungary were allies and Austria-Hungary was the nation with the biggest population, it was a fragile state, uh, which will be shown throughout the war. Spark comes on the 28th of June in the city of Sarajevo. Yep. Franz Ferdinand. Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, and is Sophia. assassinated by a 19-year-old Slav nationalist named Gavrilo Princip. Austro-Hungary accuses its Balkan rival Serbia of having aided the assassin and sends an ultimatum demanding humiliating concessions. Serbia rejects the ultimatum and Austro-Hungary yep. declares war. Within hours, Austrian forces the Serbs, as I told you, uh, one of the ideas that would uh, practically break up Austria-Hungary was the idea of uh, Yugoslavism, so that these states, so approximately this territory, joins into a new state with Serbia. Of course, the Serbs and the Austro-Hungarians were in a rivalrous position, and the Austro-Hungarians, um, prior to the war, they had a big anti-Serbian propaganda machine running all the time. Gavrilo Pr Princip was part of an organization called Mlada Bosna, or Young Bosna, Bosnia, uh, which was a revolutionary organization. And the connections between uh, the uh, assassination and Serbia was minimal. It wasn't organized by the government, it wasn't supported by the government, but some generals in secret approved and supported uh, the organization and the assassination, the organization Mlada Bosna and the assassination in Sarajevo, but it wasn't a wide, you know, like, oh, the whole government is behind that. Uh, the ultimatum on uh, from Austria-Hungary on Serbia, they had 10 points. Austria, uh, Serbia accepted nine out of 10 points and they were pretty harsh points. So uh, Austria-Hungary, uh, wanted Serbia to censor its uh, journalists so that they cannot write negative stuff about Austria-Hungary, so to suppress the idea of Yugoslavism. Uh, they had also uh, accepted the term that they are going to, n that they are not going to preach anti-Austro-Hungarian uh, things in schools. But the only thing that Serbia said, you know, like, it's against our constitution, we cannot do that, was uh, that Austria-Hungary wanted uh, to be involved in the inquiries that were happening inside of Serbia regarding to the assassination uh, assassination in Sarajevo. And that would be practically another na nation handling and uh, having influence over a judiciary of another country. And of course, Serbia rejected it because it said it's against the constitution, we cannot do it. And... Uh, yeah, Austria-Hungary Hungary, uh, declared war on Serbia because that one point uh, wasn't meant. So if we look at it through that lens, uh, we can definitely say that Austria-Hungary wanted war with Serbia. Definitely. Forces are shelling Belgrade. The Russian Tsar, Nicholas II, feels honor bound to defend Serbia, a fellow Slav nation and orders the Russian army to mobilize. German Emperor Wilhelm II... And I made a video about the start of the First World War. Officially, the First World War started in Bad Ischl, where the Austro-Hungarian uh, uh, Emperor uh, signed a declaration called An meine Völker, to my peoples or to my nations, which was practically a declaration on war of Serbia, where he called to all the nations, Croats, Slovenes, Austrians, Hungarians, let's join as brothers, blah, 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 and, uh, and you know, like, make Serbia pay for what they did. But there's also something interesting about, about the Archduke, uh, Franz Ferdinand. Uh, he had, so Austria-Hungary was divided into two parts. So uh, Cisletania, Translitania, so the Austrian and Hungarian part of the monarchy. So those two ethnicities or states had the political power inside of the state. Okay, so it was a dual monarchy. 
he, Franz Ferdinand, was actually pushing for a three-part monarchy. So one uh, to have the Austrian dominating parts, the other one to have the Hungarian dominated part, and the third one to have a Slav dominated part, because a lot of the other ethnicities were made up, uh, up of Slavs. Uh, and he was assassinated, so that idea wasn't um, even considered, you know, like by other Austrian or Hungarian officials. But yeah, Russian army just an to interesting mobilize. thing. German Emperor Wilhelm II has promised his support to Austro-Hungary. He and his generals see conflict with Russia as inevitable, and the sooner the better, as Russian strength grows year on year. Russian mobilization is used to justify German mobilization, followed by a declaration of war on Russia. Yeah, it was just like, okay, you're mobilizing, I'm mobilizing, but the mobilization of forces started even uh, years prior to the war. We can see Germany moving their troops and supply uh, and establishing supply lines uh, to the east. Austria-Hungary also uh, was establishing supply lines to the east. All the alliances in Europe back then were secret deals. Nobody knew, okay, there were definitely allies with each other. They were only assuming uh, and maybe intercepting some, some of the diplomatic channels that they had. But that was actually one of the main points that Woodrow Wilson, after the First World War, made because he wanted to keep peace in Europe, was that there shouldn't be any secret deals may, make, uh, made in the future. But, yeah. Germany knows war with Russia means war with Russia's ally, France. It has developed the Schlieffen plan to meet this threat of yeah. a war on two fronts. Neutralize France and then attack Russia. First, its armies will advance rapidly through neutral Belgium to encircle and destroy French armies near Paris and win a quick victory. Then its forces can move east to deal with Russia, whose huge army will take much longer to mobilize. And so Germany declares war on France. Six million men are now marching to war across Europe. Yeah. Italy, however, remains neutral. The terms of the Triple Alliance don't bind it to join an offensive war. The United States also declares its neutrality. President Wilson and the American public have no desire to get entangled in Europe's war. Britain is France's ally, but at first it's not clear if it will join the war against Germany. But when German troops invade Belgium, whose neutrality Britain has guaranteed, an ultimatum is sent from London to Berlin, demanding they withdraw. It's ignored, and Britain declares war. Okay, before we go to, to this section of the video, Russia, prior to the First World War, was seen as the defender of Orthodox Christians uh, in Europe and throughout the world. It was um, a conflict between them and the Ottoman Empire and different wars that they fought in one war. I cannot really remember right now which one it was. And although through a military perspective, the Schlieffen Plan was a good idea, just go through Belgium and attack through the lowlands and avoid the Maginot line, which was this part of France, so the, the bordering parts between France and Germany. On one say, sa uh, side you had the Maginot line, and on the other side, on the German side, you had the Siegfried line. Uh, they were both practically in impenetrable. So going through the lowlands in Belgium and then France and taking, on par uh, taking Paris, which is practically the heart of France, the industrial heart of France, uh, and, and also in regards to the railway system, taking out France, it would just kick out France uh, out of the war. So throughout a military perspective, it was a good plan, but from a political point of view, it was a really bad plan because by invading Belgium, it didn't only bring up negative publicity in Britain, but also in the US. And at the beginning stages of the First World War, the Germans were seen as the aggressors. So from a political PR move, it was a bad plan, but from a military uh, perspective, I can see the logic in that. Expeditionary force lands in France. 
while the German invasion is held up for crucial days by Belgian resistance at the fortress city of Liège. German troops commit several massacres against Belgian civilians. The atrocities are inflated by Allied propaganda and help turn public opinion in neutral countries against Germany. Yeah. France, Definitely. unaware of Germany's great encircling attack, launches Plan 17, an offensive into German territory. But Bad in the idea. Battle of the Frontiers, they're driven back with enormous losses on both sides. The British expeditionary force clashes with the German army at Mons, but the British are heavily outnumbered and soon join the French in retreat. The Allies make their stand at the River Marne, 40 miles outside Paris. Their desperate counterattack saves the city and drives the Germans back. Both sides suffer a quarter of a million casualties. The race to the sea begins as both sides try to outflank each other to the north. A series of clashes leads to the First Battle of Ypres, where the Allies desperately I was cling there. on and prevent a German breakthrough. I was in Belgium and also in Ypres uh, and in other cities, but that's that's not important. Uh, their um, commemoration of... The, the, they commemorate... Now Belgian people can correct me, but as I saw all the things and I went through uh, four or five different uh, cities in Belgium, they commemorate more the First World War and the victims of the First World War in Belgium than the Second World War. And they especially, they, they look it through a, they present it in a way of, you know, like there were so mu much casualties for nothing, so much human suffering and so on. So I was pretty amazed because um, I think that kind of in today's climate, the Second World War is on top of the First World War because it got, uh, there's more video footage, uh, it's more recent. Uh, it's more mainstream and so on. It's it's going to sound a pretty rough, but 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 I, I was pretty amazed that uh, the Belgians are actually commemorating the First World War that much. I, I I was really impressed. There are more heavy losses on both sides. The two armies then dig in along the entire 350 mile front, seeking shelter from deadly machine gun fire and artillery shells. Trench warfare has begun. Before we go to the battles on the sea, let's just talk about the battles that are going to take place on the land. A lot of the officer corps and generals that were serving in the First World War on either side, they were the old school generals and old school officers who still uh, regarded, you know, like full frontal attacks, glorious uh, charges. Prior to the First World War, we had the first machine gun, the Gatling gun, and then by evolution of the machine gun uh, the, uh, and making it more accessible and, and more, more cost worthy, every nation uh, acquired some type of machine gun which, which would just mold down all the, uh, all the charging regiments. So the old way or the old tactics that the old generals were using in the First World War um, weren't effective, especially, and that's why you can see that the death toll at the beginning of the war was so high because they didn't expect it. They were just going uh, to uh, through the old tactics and ways to operate. And that's why you can see that uh, let's say Germany, the, maybe the best example, started to implement new ways of uh, attacking uh, the enemy lines with the uh, so-called Sturmtruppen, uh, which was a smaller, more independent uh, company that were char would charge uh, on the enemy lines and try to uh, inflict damage that way. Uh, but it, it was a interesting evolution throughout the war to see how the tactics changed because of the new things that were introduced uh, on a wide scale in the first world war so especially the machine gun and the slow moving tanks that always got stuck somewhere british warships win the first naval battle of the war 
at Heligoland Bight, sinking three German cruisers. Yeah, Germany was no Britain match on the sea. has the most powerful Britain. navy in the world, 29 modern battleships to Germany's 19. They now impose a naval blockade on Germany, preventing contraband goods, including food, from reaching it by sea. The aim is to bring Germany's economy to its knees and force it to surrender. But a week later, the British cruiser HMS Pathfinder becomes the first victim in history of a lethal new weapon. The, the submarine-launched torpedo. torpedo. Yep. German submarines, or U-boats, have a surface range of 9,000 miles and can attack undetected from beneath the waves. They herald a deadly new challenge to Britain's command of the seas. The thermoscientific Dionics Integrion HPIC system, the entire user interface on the eastern front. Just a quick note: the torpedo uh, was invented in a small, uh, in a <laughs> small, in a Croatian city called Rijeka, and it's somewhere around here. Russian armies invade East Prussia, but they blunder into disaster at the Battle of Tannenberg, where General von Hindenburg and his chief of staff Erich Ludendorff mastermind a brilliant German victory taking 90,000 prisoners and destroying an entire Russian army. The Russians contribute to their own defeat by transmitting uncoded wireless messages. A second massive German victory at Masurian Lakes forces the Russians into retreat. In just six weeks, the Russian army suffers nearly a third of a million casualties. Just brutal. Meanwhile, Austro-Hungary's invasion of Serbia suffers a humiliating reverse at the Battle of Tsar. Austro-Hungary's offensive against Russia also ends in disaster and retreat, with the loss of more than 300,000 men. The fortress town of Chemischul is cut off and besieged by the Russians. The Germans are forced to come to the rescue, launching a diversionary attack towards Warsaw. It leads to weeks of brutal winter fighting Watch. around the Polish city of Łódź, but there is no clear winner. Meanwhile, the Turkish Ottoman Empire has joined the Central Powers, declaring war on its old enemy, Russia. Turkish warships bombard the Russian ports of Odessa and Sevastopol, yeah. while in the Caucasus, Russian troops cross the Turkish frontier. The the entrance of the Ottoman Empire was um, uh, not so much of a big deal because, uh, I mean, later on with the Battle of Gallipoli, you know, like Ottoman the Ottomans beating the expeditionary force at Gallipoli. Yeah, it was, but the Ottoman Empire wasn't a big superpower it was throughout its history. Uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, the Ottoman Empire, and uh, prior to that, so uh, in the 19th century, uh, the Ottoman uh, Empire was steadily declining, also in the 18th century, uh, and they were seen as the ill men of the Bosporus. And talking about fronts, uh, so the Western Front will be more and more entrenched, so it, it you know, like trench warfare that we all know from the First World War. But the Eastern Front was pretty brutal. So hand-to-hand -hand combat, uh, less trench warfare, and more of attacking a village. So, so you know, like the conventional war warfare that we had prior to the First World War. But yeah. While in the Caucasus, Russian troops cross the Turkish frontier. The world at war. Beyond Europe, the war rages on the world's oceans and in far-flung European colonies. German troops cross into British East Africa, modern Kenya, and occupy Tavita. Mm. While Allied forces seize the German colony of Togoland, modern Togo. But British forces invading German Cameroon are defeated at Garoa and Nsangakong. While a 3,000-strong force attacking German Southwest Africa, modern Namibia, 
is captured at Sanfontaine. A month later, British landings at Tanga end in chaos and defeat, at the hands of a much smaller German force, led by Colonel von Lettow Wolbeck. Cut off from Germany, Lettow Wolbeck goes on to wage a highly successful guerrilla war against the Allies, tying down huge numbers of troops. In Asia, Japan honours its treaty with Britain and declares war on Germany. Yeah, they are going Japanese to take the German to seize islands. the German naval base at Tsingtao. And also the German uh, New Guinea. The German colonies of Samoa and New Guinea yeah. surrender to troops from New Zealand and Australia. But in the Pacific, off the coast of Chile, German Admiral von Spee's powerful East Asia squadron sinks two British cruisers at the Battle of Coronel. Both ships are lost with all hands. Five weeks later, he runs into a British naval task force at the Falkland Islands. Four of the five German cruisers are sunk. Von Spee goes down with his flagship. Meanwhile, in the Middle East, British troops seize control of the Ottoman port of Basra, securing access to the vital Persian oil that fuels the British fleet. Is it not there that uh, the, the Lawrence of Arabia story begins? That winter, Austrian troops... Yeah, when we talk about the First World War, we always have the picture of uh, especially the Western Front in Europe, so Verdun, Ypres, uh, and those battlefields. But we always forget that the First World War, or both World Wars, were called or are called world wars because they were world worldwide. When we talk about the First World War, yeah, we look at it as uh, from a uh, Eurocentric point of view, where we always talk about the different uh, campaigns and uh, battles in Europe, and we almost always uh, discard or don't even mention the the different battles that let's say happened at the Falklands, that happened uh, at New Guinea or in Africa. So it all the all the eyes are always on Europe, but we kind of always forget that it was a world conflict, the First World War. Troops finally capture Belgrade, but the Serbs yeah, but the then Battle counter of attack and drive them back once more. The fighting in Serbia has already cost around two hundred thousand casualties on each side. In the North Sea. Yeah, in, Ser in uh, Serbian historiography and in Serbian uh, national songs, uh, they always remind uh, that Serbia fought bravely in the First World War, that they were the victims. And it was definitely a big shock for the Central Powers when Serbia has beaten them multiple times before the Austro-Hungarian Empire could eventually uh, invade Serbia and then the Serbian troops will evacuate through Al the Albanian mountains and then form a new front in Greece. But uh, Serbia definitely had put up a fight against Austria-Hungary. One also big thing to note about uh, Serbia. Serbia will actually be the one nation that's going to have the most casualties percentage-wise uh, of any other nation uh, in the world. I think it was one-fourth or one-third of the population. Something like big, big casualty numbers percentage-wise. German warships mount a hit-and-run raid against English coastal towns, shelling Hartlepool, Whitby and Scarborough, and killing more than a hundred civilians. A big, bad On the PR. Western Front, the French launch their first major offensive against the German lines. But the First Battle of Champagne leads to small gains at a cost of 90,000 casualties. While in the Caucasus, an Ottoman offensive through the mountains in midwinter ends in disaster at Sarikamish. Turkish casualties total 60,000, many frozen to death. Oh. On the Western Front, that first Christmas is marked in some sectors by a short truce and games of football in no man's land, the killing <laughs> zone between the trenches. A little bit of stress relief. Charles. Charles. 
yeah, definitely support Epic History TV. Uh, as I said, if you want to uh, join us and continue this series or other videos, just hit the subscribe button uh, and just watch the other videos. Okay, uh, definitely informative. I like their style of videos. This uh, first video on World War I was taken, I think, five years ago or four years ago. Uh, and it's pretty amazing that even four or five years ago, uh, they could make or they had those visions and ideas how a video should look like to make it great. And five years later, I think it's a unique, a pretty brilliant uh, way to showcase what happened uh, in history in different topics. Uh, is it the Napoleonic Wars, First World War, Second World War, whatever. Okay, hope that you enjoyed it. Um, give me your thoughts, opinions, and of course, corrections uh, if, I, if you think that I was wrong about something. Uh, and yeah, until the next video, see ya.